Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of our program. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle. And today we have with us Stephen Christopher, who is the CEO of Sequus Digital Marketing. Welcome to the program, Stephen. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you having me on today. Hey, so um, from looking at your bio, I understand that you have done a lot of different things, had a lot of successes, a few failures. And so what I think is really interesting to start off is, I'm sure give us a little bit of your background, but weave into that um, how a specific hiccup or roadblock or hurdle um, you experienced, you were able to get up, dust yourself off, and then move forward to some of the wonderful successes that you've seen in the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, uh, (laughs) going very far back very quickly, you know, I started my first company when I was like 14 years old Mm -hmm. and kind of got the entrepreneurial bug back then. But my parents were of the generation of, you know, you go to college, you get a job, you work, you retire, and then you go do fun stuff. And so um, I kind of put my entrepreneur spirit down for quite a few years and tried to take a, a real job after college and just found myself absolutely hating it. Um, but, uh, you know, after I started to get headaches every day, driving into the office when I was like, you know, early twenties, I realized, all right, this is just not for me anymore. So, uh, kind of fast forward a couple of years, started a, uh, a mortgage company and that was my first real business in like Oh five. And, you know, we had employees and office leases and, uh, you know, payroll stuff like that. Yeah. A real business. And, um, here, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was like a real business where other people were kind of were counting on me to run a, a successful company. And, you know, you mentioned one of the hiccups. I mean, yeah, we all know kind of what happened around 2008. And so our, our mortgage company didn't didn't do so well, like many other companies in that time. And uh, basically, at the end of the day, I got left holding the bag with about $100,000 in debt. You know, my credit was ruined. I couldn't pay rent. Um, I had to even ride a bicycle, keep my car in the garage so it didn't get repoed, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. But out of that experience was what I like to refer to as the best $100,000 that I ever invested in a business education. Wow. Because I I just, I learned so much about how to truly run a business. And, um, you know, Mike, even, even as we were kind of talking a little bit before the interview that, yeah, the, the whole economy collapsed around that time. So, it's sometimes hard to even call it a, a failure, but I, I look at it and say, you know what, if I had been more experienced, I probably could have pivoted or seen that coming. Um, so that's one of the big things that I took away mm. from that is always pay attention to what's going on, what's coming down, things that are out of your control. Um, and like with my, my current digital marketing agency, we don't go into industries that aren't resilient now. So if the economy crashes again, in a certain area, you know, we're, we're diversified enough so that, uh, you know, we're going to be okay. And that, that was that's a really, really interesting point um, there on two fronts. Number one, um, if we could rewind and say what caused um, that issue, well, it was the economy and could these be been prevented? Who knows? But you brought up the huge point about pivot. So at some point you were going, I think I can make it. I think I can make it. And you were, you know, being diligent and, and um, all of those things we learn about successful businesses is don't give up too soon. But at some point, looking back on it, knowing what you know now, sure, you could have at some point there made a pivot, made a change. But to your point, you learned a whole lot from that $100,000 mistake. And then the interesting thing now is you're guarded in who you bring on. And and I would suspect that in part of your client onboarding or even some of your conversations pre-onboarding um, that you're saying to prospects that, you know what, here's what we like to do with going into specific industries. We like to be resilient. We like to, and there is that self-preservation aspect, but I'll bet you find teachable moments to bring to your clients and prospects as far as helping them avoid what you had experienced. Absolutely. Um, I, I love I love business. I mean, that's why I do these podcast interviews. That's why I have my own podcast. I mean, I, you know, I have, I have no giveaway. I have nothing to sell or anything like that. I just, 
it's, it's really cool for me to be able to spread the experiences that I've had and hopefully impact some other business owners lives. And so uh, with even with our, our digital marketing company clients, I do find myself a lot of times talking to those owners saying, okay, you know, what are, you, what are your goals really like? Here's something that we learned about time management and processes and um, all of that kind of stuff, because that's fun for me. And now we've just created that much more of a relationship with our client. We're not only doing their, their digital marketing, but, you know, they're invested in our relationship. Um, and, and we're, you know, we have a much higher retention rate because of that. Yeah. You know, um, it, it's kind of like the, the, um, the, the, bottom line, baseline, foot in the door entry to get into your world is the, the digital marketing services you provide. But what keeps them and what excites them is all this other stuff. And, and they kind of think, wow, what am I going to miss out on if I move on from his agency? Because not only is he on the cutting edge of all the things he's doing marketing-wise, but man, he's, he's bringing some sage advice into our you know times when we are able to connect. And I think that's a really interesting holistic approach because yes, any, you have a competitor. There's other people that, that do digital marketing. Every single person in every single vertical in the market has a competitor. So we all know you can't really compete on price and do well. You've got to compete on value. So if your value is bringing that kind of knowledge base to your clients, and oh, by the way, here's your uh, digital marketing results for the month. We exceeded this. We excelled here. Boy, that's a, that's a complete package. Yeah, it, you nailed it spot on. I mean, where, what value can we add? You know, what value do, do I have? What value do members of my team have that we can add above and beyond what our competition is doing so that we differentiate ourselves? Because, I mean, quite frankly, there's people out there that uh, I, I guarantee you that are better at certain pieces of the digital marketing uh, that we specialize in than us. I mean, you know, we don't have egos here. Like I, mean, I guarantee you there's somebody that's better at it than we are. But at the end of the day, it's not always about, you know, who gets the number one spot or who gets the little bit better click through rate or, you know, that type of thing. It's, it's who can help the business and the business owner accomplish the goals of why they have a company. You know, it's not just about leads at the end of the day. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we try to differentiate ourselves as a business. Yeah, that, that's huge. So now let's uh, move to some of the things that you see in the industry in the digital marketing age. And I don't want to talk about zoo animals like pandas and you know hummingbirds and all those changes that our friends at Google make. Uh, but we do know that every other second, everything can change and, and many times does change as far as what the industry standard is on getting positioning on Google or SEO. But from a broader macro approach, what should a an approach be regarding you know internet marketing slash SEO? <laughs> so many directions that we could go with. This, yeah, we, right? we only we, we um, don't have nine hours to f to finish that question, <laughs> which I'm sure we yeah. could take twenty nine hours. I mean, here's let me. Uh, I'll give you a couple things, and then you can kind of direct me in a, a, in a in any direction that you want me to go. Here's a lot of things that we get asked questions about, um, and. You know, people say they come to us with all these strategies, right? Like, oh, you know, we heard that you got to do this and you got to do three blogs a month and you got to do citations and you got to do this. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's value in all of these things that make up web marketing and where you show up on Google and all this stuff. And I, over the last couple of years, I've really taken a lot of steps back and say, you know, does it make sense? And does it make sense of the lens through, you know, look at who is Google as a business? I mean, Google is a business, you know, take out all the stuff about them, you know, making money and people's opinions about, you know, how they do that. But, you know, as a business, really their job is to provide a searcher with the most relevant result on the web, right? I mean, that's their job, you know, they're, they're there to search or to uh, add value to searchers. And, so when we look at like web marketing from a holistic approach, it's like, all right, does it make sense? Well, you know, does it make sense to write blogs? I don't know. Look at your competition and see who's ranking and see what type of resources are available and what people are looking for. And if that makes sense, then yeah, write some really good blogs that add value to your ideal client and is a resource to them. And, you know, I, I'm sure you probably talked to a lot of people that kind of, maybe overgeneralize 
web marketing, but if we get too caught up in the details, um, you know, we miss the overall ability to succeed in the web marketing world from, Mm -hmm. at least from our opinion as a company. Um, And then the second, yeah, go ahead. Oh, finish your thought. I I was just going to say the second piece that we get asked a lot about is um, social media. You know, people come to us and like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, my com- my competitor is doing social media. You know, how much does it cost for you to manage my social media? But mm-hmm. we back up on that too and say, all right, well, you know, do you really need social media? I mean, we work with a lot of home service businesses like plumbers. Well, people just don't go to Facebook to find a plumber. Yep. Granted, there is some value there and there's some value from an SEO standpoint. But what we tell people is, you know, you don't have to be on every social media platform. Just start with one that you're already kind of good at and just tell a story on it. That's what social is all about. So really pay attention, not necessarily to what everybody's doing and just jumping on these bandwagons of, uh, you know, Snapchat and whatever the next one is that I probably don't even know about right now. Yeah. That'll Um, come out tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yeah. Just pick one and be good at it. Like, uh, you know, I primarily use Facebook. I'm good at it. I have a presence there. Um, I'm terrible at Twitter, but I have a lot of friends that are great at Twitter and they get a lot of business from it because they focus on it and start with one like, start with one tweet, Um, just do something really well. You know, what I was going to say, you made me think of an interesting thought regarding, you know, internet marketing, quote unquote, SEO and all that. Um, I think they're relevant today, but I think there's a different and fresh approach to it that people need to consider. And it's kind of like the old saying, ready, fire, aim. You know, people are just like going, oh, shiny object, SEO, do it. Oh, social media, do it. And the problem is they don't have a strategy behind it. And I know that's what you bring to your clients is, what do we want to get out of this? Who is your target audience? What is your competitive advantage? What is the message we want to bring to the market? And um, have you ever read the book called ZMOT, Z-M-O-T? No, I haven't. It's a really good one. You ought to get it. It's free. And just Google ZMOT online and you'll find the digital download. It's really good. It's written by um, uh, an ex-Google employee. And the whole bottom line of the book is, in my opinion, super groundbreaking, which is back in the day, you used to go to a you know, appliance store, car dealership, walk in, shake hands, chit chat. They'd hand you a few Colossi brochures. And, you know, that's how you learned about the products. Today, we don't do that. We walk in and go, I'll take this model at this price and this color. Why? Because we already have educated ourselves online. And the consumer today is so much different. Well, the, the moment of truth used to be when I buy the product and the moment of truth is, does it work the way it should? Now the zero moment of truth, um, and you know, my, my, uh, my wife teaches school and she, they use this, this term in their, their uh, uh, world. You know, the first hour is the first class. Well, the zero hour is when the teachers get there and they're doing whatever. So, I mean, the zero moment of truth is before the purchase is even made. It's all of the touches and all the things that people find online about you because it's out there. Google your name, Google your business, and see what in the world comes up from good reviews, bad reviews, social proof, authority positioning, all of that. Well, if we can lay those breadcrumbs out there of, you know, what are the things that your target audience is searching for? You mentioned plumbers. You know, uh, think of about this. I need a plumber in whatever town. Well, maybe that's not what you want to go for, but maybe you want to go for a little bit longer relevant search where you're going to put some content and some articles out there like how to winterize my home, just as an example, because maybe you're coming in on fall or winter and and someone wants to make sure their pipes aren't going to freeze. So maybe here's this uh, plumber that writes an article, does an interview, a podcast, whatever the asset is, and someone finds that in the area because it's it's optimized uh, with SEO optimized. They read it. It's not salesy. It's educational. Oh, that's interesting. And then maybe possibly here comes that you know retargeting pixel or that Facebook pixel, and now that ties in the social media. And maybe then it's just some brand ads. Hey, if you want to run around your home, give us ABC Plumbing a call. So my my question to you is with that thought in mind with the content marketing educational approach, how do you interweave and intertwine that into your designs and in your websites? Um, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, That's what I, I thought yeah, you would I say. Love, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love the strategy. I mean, 
what we're kind of going for now, well, like with our web designs, when you look at the home pages of the of the sites we're designing now, I mean, you know, we're getting rid of a lot of the content. You know, we're allowing people to kind of we're allowing a business to tell a story and build brand trust, um, and then back it up with social proof and add value. That's kind of like the the, mm-hmm. the big chunks of what we try to put on a home page, and you know, getting rid of all this big all these big pieces of content and stuff so that when a consumer comes to the site, you know, talking specifically about the homepage right now, you know, they can kind of figure out everything that they would need to about that business right on one page. And then Mm -hmm. they can also take action. And then the cool thing about, you know, with Google and how uh, contextual search and how, uh, you know, you're landing on a lot more interior pages that are specific for what you're looking for. Like you're talking about with, uh, you know, how to winterize your home, the whole content marketing piece. um, We don't put as much of that on the homepage. Now, you know, we kind of hide some of that stuff because, it's generally not the number one thing that our client wants somebody to find. So we don't want to confuse the client. We don't want to give them too many options. You know, if they land on the homepage, they got there for these, you know, let's say five reasons and we want them to be able to take action. But if they land on an interior page, like a blog or a content piece, then we want them to kind of have a whole different experience. We don't want them to feel like they're being, pushed to do something, Mm -hmm. but we have to make sure we give them the opportunity to do something. And so often people forget about that. Like when we take on a new client, we'll go through and look at their blogs or their resources. And you know, you have this great blog that people are landing on, but then on the right hand column, it's just like archives, you know, January, 2015, February, 2015. It's all this kind of like distracted, wasted space. And they don't even give the customer the opportunity to contact them or the opportunity Mm. to have value added to them. So, you know, I mean, to people listening, pay attention to what's going on in your interior pages because chances are, if you're doing this stuff right, there's a lot of people landing that that never even see your homepage. So pay attention. Yeah, and you know, that kind of also gets into a whole other conversation, which could take hours upon hours, which is the um, uh, customer journey. You know, they start here and they have certain questions. Well, when they're a little bit more engaged and they understand a little bit more because you don't know what you don't know until you know something, then now what should you deliver to them? Because they might not be ready for that full-on webinar day one. Maybe just they need that, you know, quick checklist or whatnot. Um, so I think that's it just gets back to that strategy. You cannot just unleash on someone because it's too much too soon. Um, and then also from your perspective, the the design perspective, it needs to be, you know, one shot. Do I even want to continue on on this website to another page? Because it's got to have a nice look and feel. It's got to be inviting, engaging, warm, all of that. So I think that that's a, that's a huge piece. Do, to, on, a, on a side note, how do you, as your agency, deal with clients that are asking for something that you just know for a fact would not be good from a design standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, and they just seem to be like stuck back in the old, uh, um, old days of, of how they do websites? Yeah, great question. So we saw that as an issue, uh, you know, a couple of years ago and how we got rid of it is we did a better client intake process and we, we spent more time building trust up front that we're the experts. And then, so we kind of, we, we saw the issue of that happening and got rid of the real problem, you know, the root problem so that now we just really don't deal with it ever mm-hmm. anymore. Um, but when we were dealing with it, it depends on the client, right? I mean, we all, we've all had that client where, I mean, it is just, there is no way around. They, they must have this thing done. Um, and if that's the case, we would try to find examples of where it did not work on other sites. And then we would really have a, a an internal conversation of, Hey, is this our ideal client? And, you know, are we going to do something that we know is not serving to the client just because they want it and they're the ones paying the bill? And, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, that conversation would go different ways. Sometimes we would end up doing it um, if it was like a small investment, you know, on the client side and we knew it would be quick and it wouldn't really mess up anything else. And then we could kind of just sweep it under the rug and be done with it. Uh, to just say, hey, you know what, you're you're just not the right fit for us. We appreciate your business, but um, you know, here's a couple other companies that might be able to help you with what you need. 
Yeah, and you know, um, you touched on something that, again, is a huge, huge piece that we could talk for hours on end on, which is you don't have that objection come up much because you've done some things like pre-objection to educate them on why this and this and this strategy is is going to work. So it kind of um, circumvents them coming up with, yeah, but we, because they, they get it, it's like, oh, yeah, that that makes total sense. And I think that's huge in business because, you know, and at the end of the day, there's so many ways to do so many things. And sometimes given the moon and the stars and, and what you wore yesterday and what you had for breakfast, maybe something would work differently. But the point is there's foundational things that always, always work. And, and your clients aren't so en- engrossed in the industry that they know all of that. You've done the A-B testing and, and all of that. So that's where they have to rely on you to bring that uh, knowledge base to them. So I, I, I love your approach to strategy. Um, let's close uh, with one last topic, which is your involvement with Front Row Foundation. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that you brought that up. Um, that's so cool. So Front Row Foundation is, it's an organization that, I mean, kind of their tagline is creating memories for a lifetime. And I became friends with the person who started, his name is John Broman, probably one of the most amazing humans I've ever met. Uh, and, and one of the top, I mean, easily top five speakers I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, it is a foundation that gives a front row experience to essentially terminally ill patients. So it sends Mm. them to the concert of their dreams, the event of their dreams, something, you know, uh, living life in the front row. And they, they film this whole experience. So it's not just going to the concert, but it's this whole experience. I mean, they'll pick them up in a limo. They go to like this restaurant of their choice. They go sit front row. They, you know, a lot of times they'll meet the person after the show. Um, and this is all filmed, and uh, it, you know it's it's very it's very tough because fifty um, percent about of their recipients uh, pass away within about six to eight months after the experience. Mm. But they videotape this uh, so well that now this family has this this fantastic kind of final memory of that person um, forever. And yeah. it's just uh, the, the, Im- the impact that it makes on families' lives is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, and it's a charity that, you know, we, we do anything that we can for this charity. Uh, there was actually just an event in Denver, and we went and made all these signs for this, uh, this six-year-old uh, boy uh, named Jaden who has uh, brain cancer. And all he wanted was to go to the circus, and his family wasn't able to really afford the time and the money and stuff. And so they sent his whole family to the circus and a limo and ice cream and all this cool stuff. And so we went and helped signs and cheered for him like this red carpet experience. And, um, you know, that, that family is going to have that forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just it, it's priceless. So. Um, yeah, well, I, I love the way that they do that. Um, not only the what they do, but adding the video for the experience because I would suspect that just having the experience is wonderful. But for the family to see the person, child or adult, the person, the recipient's reaction years down the road, looking at that video would be priceless. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I've met some of the the parents or the family of these recipients that are no longer with us. And I mean, they just say, I mean, it's amazing. It's, they can watch this video and experience such great joy of the memories where that person was happy. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, it's amazing. Um, Yeah. So I, I I love that. I love uh, when, when companies get behind uh, movements and causes like that and, and being able to pour into other people's lives is just, is just spectacular. So I I'm, was really impressed when I saw that you had that right on your website. And, and so that's awesome. So, Hey, um, let's close with, uh, what is the best way for people to learn more about Sequest digital marketing? What's your website and contact info? Awesome. Website is sequest.com S E E Q U S.com. Um, if you submit anything through the website, you know, if you just have questions or I don't know, whatever, want to talk about business, I, I love this stuff. Um, we answer all of those forms. And so I uh, just submit whatever questions you have, happy to answer them. And then um, from the entrepreneur side, I, I run a 
podcast as well, but we have a really cool little Facebook group that there's a lot of support in. Um, if you're interested in it, it's uh, bizrevolution.com forward slash Facebook. Um, that's where I have a lot of my conversations. So feel free to join in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Stephen. It was wonderful getting to know you and your company and your background and your passion. Thank you so much. Yeah, Mike, thank you. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today. 